Here's a sketch of our Middle East, even as we know it today. Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. All right, down here is Jerusalem, just west of the Dead Sea. Over here is Damascus. Now, the normal trade routes, of course, from Egypt went right up along the Mediterranean Sea coast and off the northern part of Galilee and over through Damascus and on out to the east. All right, now this is where Paul received his tremendous uh, experience on the road to Damascus, his conversion. All right, but now he says, I did not go down to Jerusalem, which would have been logical to the twelve, he went where? Into Arabia. He goes out into the desert. And instead of going west, he goes east. Now, what's God doing? Keeping him as far from the twelve as he possibly can. Why? Well, can't you imagine how Peter, James, and John would just literally bombard the man now that he's interested in these things? And they'd have nothing, nothing, they would have done nothing but confuse the issue. So God providentially sends him east instead of west to the twelve. Now think about that. Think about it. If God wanted Paul to preach the same thing that Peter, James, and John had preached, he would have sent him back to Jerusalem. They had all the experience. They had the knowledge. But God doesn't. He makes sure that he doesn't get mixed up with Peter, James, and John. And so he sends him east into the desert, to Arabia. And I think that the same Sinai where he gave the law to Moses. That's my own impression. You don't have to buy that if you don't want to. Because over in chapter 4, turn the page in your Bible to Galatians chapter 4. It just tells us what's in Arabia. Galatians 4, verse 25. The verse itself has nothing to do with this, but it's just the geographical connotation. Verse 25, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai, where? In Arabia. Now just use some common sense on some of these things. Now that's what I say, I don't put this in concrete, and I don't say this is the way you have to see it. But doesn't it make common sense that Mount Sinai was the mountain of God. In fact, we were out in that area a few years ago, and the guide told us that the Arabs still call what they think is Mount Sinai. They're not sure, but whatever they think is Mount, the mountain of God. Because that's the mountain where God dealt with Moses and gave the law and over and over. All right, I think it was that same mountain down there in Arabia then that the Apostle Paul was taken and God spent the most of three years revealing to this man all these doctrines that we call the revelation of the mysteries. See? Things that had never been revealed before, that were kept secret and now revealed. Okay? So now reading on back in Galatians 1. So immediately he does not confer with flesh and blood, but now back to Galatians 1, verse 17. I... Neither did I go up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem and so on and so forth. All right, now then we've got to come back to Acts chapter 11. Time is going by, remember. Time doesn't stand still. We are now up to about uh, 40 A.D. Pentecost in 29, so we're already 11, 12 years after the crucifixion. Acts chapter 11, and I use this verse constantly because it's the one verse that probably opened up the scriptures to me more than anything else I've ever read. And I just saw that the first time years back, and it just boggled my mind. I thought, well, now why hasn't anybody ever shown this to me before? Why do you never see it in a, in a quarterly? Why don't you ever hear a sermon on it? Well, I don't know the answer, but I know I never did, and I doubt if you do. But look what it says. Acts 11, verse 19. Now, this is after Peter now has been up to the house of Cornelius. This is after Paul has had his three years in the wilderness, and he's already gone back up to his hometown of Tarsus to begin preaching to Gentiles. 
But now look what's happening here in Acts 11:19. Now they who were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose around Stephen. Now stop right there. What persecution are we talking about? Who was the persecutor? Saul of Tarsus. And who was he persecuting? The Jewish believers who had embraced Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. And because of Saul's intense persecution, as he said, he wasted that Jerusalem church. He just literally destroyed it. Okay, so here we pick it up now again that those who had been scattered because of that persecution of the Jewish church and they were scattered abroad upon the persecution that rose about Stephen. They traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and on up into Antioch, which is up in Syria. Now, don't miss the last part of the verse. They went preaching the word, Old Testament. There's no New Testament written yet in 40 AD. They go out preaching the Old Testament to none but what? Jews only. That's what your book says. I'm not telling you that. The book says it. That these Jews who had been scattered by Saul's persecution out of Jerusalem were now penetrating other areas of the eastern Mediterranean, but they were preaching to none but Jews only. Isn't that right in line with what I've been telling you all day? These Jews had no concept of going to Gentiles. They were concerned only with the nation of Israel. All right, but here is the transition kicks in gear, right here. And some of them, now these are Jews, remember, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they were come to Antioch, up there in Syria, north of present-day Lebanon, they spoke unto the Greeks. Gentiles are showing an interest. And they preached to those Greeks the Lord Jesus. Now that's still all these Jews know is that Jesus whom they crucified was the Messiah. That's all they've got yet because Paul hasn't come into the picture. All right? Now, just to show you the mentality of the Jerusalem church, it isn't totally gone, but it's been decimated. But the 12 are still up there. You know that. Acts 8, verse 1 says they were all scattered except the 12 apostles. They're still there. All right. So now then, verse 22. Now, this is, this is so interesting. Almost amusing if it weren't so sad. When tidings of these things, what things? Gentiles showing an interest in the things of Israel's God? Yeah. And so when tidings of these things reach the ears of the Jerusalem church, now who's the Jerusalem church? Peter, James, and John and the rest. Were they hallelujah and all over the place? No. Anything but when the tidings of these things reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Well, now again, you've got to read between the lines. Why are they sending Barnabas up to Antioch? Check out the heresy that's going on up there. Our people are dealing with Gentiles. Barnabas, go see what's going on. But you know what? God always has the right man for the right hour for the right place. I think if Jerusalem would have sent anybody but Barnabas up there, they would have squashed it right then and there. They would have dealt with it. But good old Barnabas. Now read the next verse. When he came, verse 23, and had seen the grace of God. That's about the first time you've seen that. Now he sees the grace of God working. How? On these pagan Gentiles. And Barnabas was glad. He wasn't all shook up like any other Jew would have been. But Barnabas, because he was full of the Holy Ghost, verse 24, he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit, a man full of faith, and much people were added to the Lord. Now we have to assume that these are mostly Gentiles. 
Now, as soon as Barnabas sees these pagan Gentiles showing such an interest, the Spirit leads him, who's the man of the hour? Paul. Look at the next verse. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for what one purpose? To find Saul. Well, what do you suppose the Spirit has told him? Barnabas, Gentiles are getting in, in, interested. I've got an apostle for the Gentiles. Go find him. And so he heads up north from Antioch up to the area of Tar. Not that far, probably 30, 40 miles. And so he seeks Saul. Now verse 26. And when he had what? Found him. Now doesn't that say it all? What did he do? He looked. And he looked. You know, it's just like the old cartoons, you know. Have you seen this little Jew? Yeah, he went that away. And old Barnabas, I think he was a big guy. I think Saul was little. And big old Barnabas goes plodding up the road until he found him. And when he found him, what did he do? Brought him back to Antioch. See? And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that for a whole year they assembled themselves with the church or the assembly, which is now predominantly Gentile. And who in the world is instructing these people? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. Okay. And it was there that these followers be called Christians first in Antioch. Okay, Ephesians 1. Drop down to verse 10. That in the dispensation or the administration of the fullness of time, he, God, might gather together in one all things in Christ and so on and so forth. All right, that's a dispensation, a period of time during which God is going to deal with the human race in a particular way. Now turn over to chapter 3. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 3. And you might as well start with verse 1. For this cause. Now, of course, he's referring back to the first two chapters of Ephesians, which is, For by grace are you saved through faith, plus nothing, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast, but you've been created unto good works. But the whole concept of the first two chapters is that salvation is by faith and faith alone in that finished work of the cross. All right, now in chapter 3, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentile. Now, of course, the prisoner aspect is because he's writing from a Roman prison. He's under arrest because of the Jews, and he's in prison in Rome. <clears throat> and the purpose was that the Jews hated it, that he was going to the Gentiles. Now here comes verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. Now watch it real carefully. Which is given to me, to you. Word. You see what that says? That tells you that the whole dispensational requirements or responsibilities of the age of grace were laid out to this apostle who in turn took it to the Gentiles. Now look at it carefully again. If you have heard of the dispensation, this period of time during which God is dealing with the whole human race based on his grace and his finished work of the cross, all right, if you have heard of that dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you were. So how did the human race get the dispensation of grace? Paul. Where do you find everything that pertains to the dispensation of grace? Paul. You won't find it anywhere else. And that's why most of Christendom totally ignores it. To their own doom. I'm afraid millions upon millions of church members are going out to a lost eternity because they absolutely reject Paul's gospel. And Paul's gospel, of course, is 1 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 15. Verses 1 through 4. Now, of course, whenever you read Scripture, you always have to Im realize what's implied, even though it may not be written. Now, we know that 
Saul of Tarsus started right out with his conversion experience proclaiming that Jesus the Christ was the Son of God. Even though he does not say that in 1 Corinthians 15, we know that that's part of Paul's thinking, that this gospel is centered on the one who was the Son of God, the creator of everything. All right, 1 Corinthians 15. So here is Paul's gospel. And you know what? You can't find this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Even John 3.16 doesn't say this. And here it is. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you not a gospel, but what? The gospel which I preached unto you, which also you... Now remember, the Corinthians were what kind of people? Gentiles. See? And which you have received, and wherein you stand. By which also... What's he talking about? His gospel. By which also you are saved. And here's the condition. That you keep in memory that you know what I preached unto you, lest you believe in vain. Now here comes the gospel. This is what we must believe for salvation. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Received from where? The ascended Lord. The ascended Lord, which I received, and how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. That's the gospel. Plus nothing. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the creator of everything, went to that Roman cross and died for the sins of the world. He was buried. He was really dead. And by the miraculous supernatural power of the Almighty God, he was raised from the dead to our justification. And when we believe it, God has promised to give us eternal life. No strings attached. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to give 10%. You don't have to do this. You believe the gospel. And when you believe the gospel, then we're not under law. We're under grace. And here's where we draw the line. Okay, now come back with me to Romans. These are all truths that are part and parcel of this dispensation of the grace of God. You won't find these things anywhere else in Scripture because they were part of the secret things that God revealed to this apostle. That's why Peter said, go to the epistles of Paul because of the wisdom given to him. And this is what we have to understand, that Paul is our apostle. You don't throw the rest of your Bible away. Of course not. We can study Christ's earthly ministry. We can study the Old Testament. We can understand what the law demanded, but we're not under that. We're under grace. Okay, now here it is. This says it about as plainly as I can find. Romans 7, verse 6. Well, let's just start at verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, in other words, before our salvation, whether we were young or old, for when we were in the flesh, the motions or the acts of sins, plural, which were by the law. Now stop a minute. What sins, plural, are designated by the law? Well, adultery, thieving, gossiping, Profanity, coveting, follow me? Those were sins that were definitively expressed in the law. All right? Every human being, I've got to watch my language, English here. Every human being is guilty <laughs> of these things. I'll get around it. Because it comes naturally. I mean, adultery is something that you don't have to tell somebody how to commit adultery. It just comes naturally. You don't have to tell somebody how to steal. You don't have to tell somebody how to gossip. It just comes naturally. See? All right? So these things which were de defined by the law, they worked in our members, that is, our human makeup, to bring forth fruit unto what? Death. See? 
Now what does Romans 6.26 say? For the wages of sin are death. Spiritual death. Because every day that the lost person keeps committing these sins, he's piling up for his judgment day. Because the books are going to be opened, see? All right, so all these things that were part and parcel of our life as an unbeliever did nothing but bring forth fruit unto death. But next verse, but, see? But now, we as believers are delivered from the law. The law no longer convicts us because we've been crucified to it and it's been crucified to us. All right? So we are delivered from the law that being dead, I'm going to have to take this slowly because this is not surface stuff. This is deep. This is where most people never get. That we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held by the law. The law was severe. The law stipulated that if somebody was guilty of picking up sticks on the Sabbath day, what was the punishment? Death. Death for a simple thing like picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. And that's where the law keeper finds himself, if he really wants to understand it. He's under the constant penalty of death. All right? That we should serve, now as believers, we should serve or live seven days a week in the newness of the Spirit. What's that? When we become a believer, the Spirit comes in. And the Holy Spirit takes the place of the law. Now, is that so hard to understand? I don't have to have the Ten Commandments on the wall. You as a believer, you don't have to have the Ten Commandments constantly remind you, thou shalt not and thou shalt. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit who takes its place. The Holy Spirit will constantly tell the believer, don't do that. But you see where the law could just simply say, don't do it. The Spirit empowers us not to do it if we let him. Oh, what a difference. See, when the legalist says, well, I don't know if I'm good enough. Well, I can see why he does. He can never know if he's good enough. But see, I don't have to worry about if I'm good enough. Christ was on my behalf. In fact, when we started the book of Hebrews, all you have watched the Hebrews program. Remember, I made the analogy that there were only two times in all of human history that God did something so perfect, so flawless, there wasn't another thing he could do to improve it. And I gave the example, you can take the best contractor in Oklahoma, and he can build a $3 million home, and I'll bet you dollars to donuts that after the people have lived in it a few days, they're going to be calling him and say, hey, I've got a door that doesn't fit right. I've got a window that doesn't work right. I've got this wrong. It's not flawless. There's needs for... But when God finished two things in human history, it was so perfect that he could sit down and didn't have to worry that somebody would call and say, but it isn't quite right. You know when it was? At the end of creation in Genesis 1. He looked at creation and what was it? Perfect. It was so good. It was so perfect that in chapter 2, what did he do? He rested. Well, when you rest, what does that imply? He sat down. Nothing more he could do. All right, now you get to Hebrews chapter 1, and Paul brings that same thing. And when he had purged us from our sin, where did he do that? At the cross. And when he had purged our sin, when he had finished the work of the cross, it was so flawlessly done, it was so fully perfect, that again he could do what? He sat down. And what does that indicate? There wasn't another thing he could do. And then I put it this way. You remember on the program? It's just like if one of you ladies have polished a brass lamp and you've got it flawlessly polished. There's not a spot on it. You can just see yourself in it like a plate glass mirror. And then here comes, I don't like two-year-olds. I guess you all know that. <laughs> here comes the little two-year-old with his sticky jammed fingers. 
and he grabs a hold of that beautiful lamp. What has he done with it? Ruined it. Ruined it. But you know what? That's what the human race has been doing with God's plan of salvation since day one. Just as soon as the Apostle Paul came out with this beautiful, flawless gospel of the grace of God, what does the human race start doing? Oh yeah, but that's not quite enough. You've got to be baptized, you've got to be this, and you've got to be that. No, no. Now those things are all right in their own place, but not as salvation. Sad, isn't it? How that the human race... I think I told you in the last hour or so, I had a young man call from... Uh, Chicago, where his pre a preacher was just screaming, unless you give me 10% of your income, you're going to live under a curse. I, I shared it with you. Hey, listen, that's not in this book. There's nothing like that in here. By the grace of God, that work of the cross is so flawlessly perfect, we can trust it. We can just revel in it. And we don't do it in the end of the flesh because the moment we trust that work of the cross, the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to control our lives if we let him. That's the beauty of this age of grace. All right, now I just had someone ask a break time whether I would touch on it, so I suppose this is as good a place as any. Uh, finishing verse 6, though, before we move on. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead were in real held, we should serve in newness of spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter, which is Paul's word for the law. Well, on that same vein, I'm going to Corinthians anyway. Stop at Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Almost the same, the same concept. Now this is Paul writing, of course, to the Gentile church at Corinth. The most carnal of all of his congregations. They had a lot of problems. But he says, verse 5, 2 Corinthians 3, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. In other words, not a one of us can do the will of God in the flesh. We just can't do it. But our sufficiency is of God, who also, God, who also made us able ministers of the New Testament. Here it comes now. Not of the letter, not in keeping the law, but of the Spirit. See this? It's the Spirit spirit that takes the place of the law in our everyday experience. We don't have to go look at those Ten Commandments. Let's see. I've got to be reminded. No, no. The Spirit is constantly leading us into the very same things that the law, of course, promoted because that's the mind of God. All right, now read on in verse 6. For the letter, the law, does what? Kills. The law killeth. How do you figure? Because we're building up works of unrighteousness for the day of judgment. And the law can't obliterate that. Impossible. You know, I've had three people tell me now of ministers who at the end of their ministry would come to finish their days with their particular home because he was either the father of the wife or of the husband. But in all three of those instances that they shared with me in various parts of the country, these gentlemen would just pace their living room floor. And what do you suppose is on their mind? If only I knew where I'm going to spend eternity. Yeah, you've heard it, haven't you? That's awful. And this one guy said... It was his father-in-law, but he called him dad. And he said, Dad, you have been an evangelist in your church for 25 years, and you don't know? He says, how can I? Have I done enough? That's awful. We don't do it by works. It's by faith and faith alone that this work of the cross was sufficient. And when we believe it, we're safe. All right, read on. 
For the letter, the law, works, legalism, killeth. It's not going to bring salvation. It's going to bring eternal doom. But the Spirit giveth life. Now, when people say, I'm keeping the commandments, they don't realize that they're really practicing a death sentence. Isn't it? That's what it is. The law is a death sentence. Next verse. But if the ministration of death. Now, you won't believe he's talking about the law until you read the next phrase. What's the ministration of death? It was written engraven in stone. Goodness sakes. What well-known document was written by the finger of God in stone? Ten Commandments. That's what he's talking about. But if that ministration of death, the Ten Commandments, written and engraven in stone was glorious, and it was in its time, in its time of dispensation, sure it was adequate. But in this dispensation, oh, it just becomes total Failure, see? So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit, this age of grace, be rather or more glorious? All right, now I said while you're in Corinthians, we're going to look at what Paul says about tithing, about giving. Absolutely God expects us to give, but he's not going to tell you how much. That's up to you and the Spirit again. And that's the beauty of it. You're not under any set rules and regulations. In fact, I just shared with somebody on phone the other day, you know that very few people understand the true meaning of the Old Testament tithe. You go back and study the tithe. It wasn't 10%. It was what? One out of 10 Oh, you say, what's the difference? Ha! Huh, all the difference in the world. If a Jew had 19 sheep, he didn't give 10%. He would have had to kill one of them and parcel it. Right? He would have had to give 1.9. But did he? No, you don't know, do you? <laughs> no, when he counted his sheep under the rod, as Leviticus puts it, if he had 19 sheep, he gave one out of 10. One. He couldn't give a tenth of the nine because it wasn't the full ten. If he had ten omers of barley, he gave one. If he had nineteen, he gave one. And all you see everything today is ten percent. No, Paul never uses that term. He never used the term tithe. He uses offering. All right, here it is. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 6. Here's the Pauline concept of giving. And it's because we're under grace, not under law. Tithing was part of the law. Verse 6, But this I say, He who soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? Now, come on, you've got wheat farmers all over Oklahoma. I imagine some of you have got your roots out there. All right, if a wheat farmer was going to go out there, see, the normal, if I remember correctly, Todd, do you remember? What's the actual sowing rate? Three bushels per acre? He don't know either. <laughs> if I remember right, at least when I farmed it north for oats, which was a small grain, I think three bushels the acre was our normal seeding rate. So if you sow one bushel the acre, what kind of a crop are you going to get? Next to nothing. But if you go out there and think, boy, I'm really going to work this one over. I'm going to sow 10 bushels to the acre. What do you get? Nothing. It comes up so thick it can't do anything. So you've got the ridiculous and the sublime. All right, so you do things in order. And so Paul says, if you sow sparingly, if you're not going to give, you're going to be a tightwad, then don't expect an awful lot of blessings from God either. But on the other hand, don't try and manipulate him by a letter like I had here a while back. Now, here's where I'm different from all your other ministries. This gal out in, I think, Kentucky, wrote a letter with all of their problems, their medical expenses, and the rent was due. So what does she do but sends the ministry $500 with the request that we ask God to multiply that by 10 times? That would be what, 5,000? 
You know what I did? I sent it back to her. And I said, lady, you've been watching too many television preachers. God doesn't work that way. God doesn't expect you to give and then pray to multiply it ten times. That's manipulating him. He won't have it. So I said, you better use this 500 bucks to pay some of your bills. But you see, this is what so many people are getting the idea that they can manipulate God. If I give him a hundred, he'll give me a thousand back. That doesn't what the books say. All right, but here's what it does say. He who soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Now verse 7. This is the criteria for grace age giving. Every man as he purposeth in his heart. Now, who's controlling the heart of the believer? The Holy Spirit, again, see? So every man, as he purposeth in his heart, let him give. Now, that's common sense. That's practical giving. And if you haven't got that with all to give, God doesn't expect you to give it. Don't go back to that widow's might because that was under law. That's not under grace. And if you can spare it, give it. If you can't, don't think you have to. You go as the Lord has laid it on your heart, not grudgingly. Now, you know what? How many millions of church members lay that 10% in that offering plate every Sunday morning grudgingly? I wish I didn't have to give this today. I need it for something else. God can't use that. He can't bless that. If you can't give happily, What's the word here? Cheerful. cheerful. You know what the word cheerful really means? Hilarious. You should be able to hilariously give. Okay? For God loves a hilarious giver. He doesn't want somebody that's giving it just because the law mandates it. You give as the Lord lays it on your heart, and he will. You'd be surprised how he will just all of a sudden put a thought in your mind, so-and-so needs some money. Such and such an organization, they, they can use some money. Okay, that's enough on giving. Now, where do I want to go next? Oh, back to Romans 3. I want to come back to Romans 3. Verse 19 and 20. Now this is as Pauline as you can get. Romans 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law, now that's the Ten Commandments, that whatever the Ten Commandments say, it says to them who are under the law. Who was under the law? Israel. Not the Gentile world. Only Israel was under the law. God didn't expect the Gentiles to keep the law. They weren't under it. But Israel was. But the law didn't stop at Israel's borders either. And read on. That every mouth, not just Jews, but that Every mouth may be stopped. And all the world, not just Israel, all the world may become what? Guilty. And that's all the law can do. That's all the law can do is point the finger of guilt. It can save nobody. Now read on. Therefore, by the deeds or the keeping of the law, there shall no flesh, not one soul, is going to enter into God's heaven because they kept the commandments during this age of grace. It's not going to happen. I'll guarantee it. Therefore, by the keeping of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Why? The law only has one purpose today. And what is it? Finish the verse. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's all the law can do is show a person their sin. 
That's why Paul said that in his Damascus Road experience, all of a sudden that law-keeping Jew, who Pharisee of the Pharisee, he thought he was almost perfect in God's eye. What did he suddenly realize? That the law was condemning him. He was a sinner. He was covetous. See? And so, all the law can do is show the knowledge of sin. But verse 21, like a lady wrote to me, uh, she says, you like to use but now. Well, if I do, it's because it's always in the book. Over and over, Paul says, but now. Here's another one. But now. We're not under the condemnation of the law. But now. The righteousness of God. What's the next word? Without the law is manifested. It's just brought out into the spotlight. But it's being witnessed by the law and the prophet. That's why I said this earlier. You've you got to know this top line. Understand it. Because on all the dealings of God with Israel, bringing about the cross and the ascension, and his opening up of the age of grace, this is what makes our gospel so understandable. Ma, you can just see how it all unfolded. That Israel rejected it in unbelief. They crucified their Messiah and brought about God's means of salvation for the whole human race. Christ went back to glory, sat down because this work was so perfect. And then he commissioned the Apostle Paul down on this line now. Commissioned the Apostle Paul to reveal these mysteries and call out this body of Christ, which is the church, in which there are no unbelievers. There are no unbelievers in the body of Christ. Now see, every one of our churches are probably 50-50, half saved and half lost. Maybe I'm a little cruel there, but by and large, you know, on, on average, you've got a lot of churches where they haven't probably got 10% that are saved. The rest are unsaved church members. You may have others where it's inverse, but I dare say that on average, across the spectrum, I'm being kind if I say that 50% of church members are saved. You want to know how to find out? I know we can't judge. I never look at a person's salvation by the heart. But just look at their attitude towards spiritual things. You know, I've given the illustration when I was still up in Iowa. We had a Saturday night class. And I made the statement that I didn't think that over 10% of our little rural community were believers. We had seven churches, a little town of 1,200 people. And one of the ladies in the class was just aghast. She said, Les, that can't be. And I said, well, I said, you've got the one and only restaurant in town. And I said, most of the community comes through at one time or another for coffee or lunch or whatever. Yeah, she had to admit that a good many of them did. I said, for the next week, just sort of analyze. We can't judge. Don't ever think for a minute that we can judge. Self. But we can, what's the expression? We're fruit inspectors. We can be fruit inspectors. So the next Saturday night, I was already starting. She said, wait a minute, last I got homework to report on. I said, okay. I forgot. What did you find out? She says, you're dead wrong. Boy, my heart just sank, you know. Here I thought I'd made my point. She says, you're dead wrong. I said, Edith, you've got to be kidding. No, she says, you're wrong. She says, they're not near 10%. <laughs> now, it's not funny, but really. That's so true. I said, now... What brought you to that conclusion? She said, I started listening to conversations. The profanity, the filthy, filthy stories. And she says, I even tried to approach one or two of my own church people. And she says, they just ridiculed me. Who did I think I was? Talking about things like this in the middle of the week. You know, Sunday is the only time you talk about spiritual things. All right. And you can just tell, got a lady right here in Tulsa back in 1990 when we had just started our TV program. And oh, she was so excited. She wanted to get a home Bible study started. And I said, yeah, go ahead. And I said, we'll drive up to Tulsa. Well, of course, our Friday night class is still a result of that. But you talk about a gal that was devastated. She went to all of her close neighbors and church friends and every one of them just looked at her cross-eyed and said, we're not into that kind of stuff. Not even a Bible study? No, they're not interested. 
Well, now listen, don't tell me that the rank and file true believer has no interest in Bible study. They're going to. If they truly love the Lord, they're going to love the Word. And if they have no interest, then I have every reason to kind of inspect the fruit. And it's not going to be very positive. I asked a lady the other day, I said, do you have a prayer life? Do you ever pray? Oh, heavens no. I said, then why in the world are you calling me with your problems? Learn how to pray. Learn how to study the Word. Oh, she claimed to be a believer, see? But this is what I'm talking about. The rank and file church member, when they've done that Sunday morning service, that's enough for one week. No, it isn't. My, we should hunger for this six, seven days a week. And, well, I suppose it's not an unfair way of putting it, but I do. Where would these people rather be on a Saturday night? In a Bible study with fellow believers or out there in the world living it up? Sobering, isn't it? Most of our church people would rather party on Saturday night as to be in a Bible study. And so this is what we're talking about, see, that the vast majority have never entered into this love relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, now verse 22. Even the righteousness of God. That scares people. They don't want to be that righteous. They don't want to be that holy. They don't want to be that good. Well, now listen, I never ask anybody to put a halo on their head and walk with their nose up in the air and say, well, I'm too good to associate with you. No, that's not the Christian life. The Christian life, you've heard me say it over and over, is the most practical thing on earth. There is nothing in this world more practical than Pauline Christianity. Why? Let me show you. I wrote a letter to one of the editorial writers of the New York Times. Haven't heard back, have we, Laura? <laughs> we probably won't. But this is what I read. He made a statement how that he would oppose evangelical Christianity every chance he had because he thought it was destroying America. <laughs> so I wrote him just a short letter, and I said, what would you rather live under? And then this is what I quoted. Turn with me to Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verse 19. Now when Paul speaks of the flesh, he's speaking of the unbeliever. When he speaks of the spirit, he's speaking of the believer. So in my little short letter, I asked this gentleman, which one of the following two paragraphs would you rather live under in your nation, community, or neighborhood? Paragraph 1, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh, and then I put in parenthesis the non-evangelical, because they were the evangelicals that he hated so. Okay, now the works of the flesh, the non-evangelical, are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Isn't that the general world today? Sure it is. Idolatry. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, I have told you in times past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Paragraph 1. Paragraph 2. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Now I'll ask you, what kind of a community would you prefer to live in? Paragraph 1 or paragraph 2? Why, of course. Of course, paragraph 2. Compared to a, a community that's filled with immorality and broken homes and wayward kids, wouldn't you much rather live in a community with love and joy and peace and meekness? Of course. Well, see, that's the practicalness of Christianity. There it is. I can't make it any plainer. This is practical Christianity. Love, joy, peace, and so forth. 
Paul never tells us to walk around like a Pharisee holier than now. We're all sinners saved by grace. But oh my goodness, what a difference between trying to live a life of good works and merit salvation and then have nothing to keep us from all the works of the flesh compared to living under the control of the Spirit and having a love for the Word and for fellow believers. Oh, it's just no comparison, see? Okay, back to Romans chapter 3. Verse 22, we've got to move quickly. Got a few things I want to cover. So the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, witnessed by the law, the righteousness of God, which is by the faith or the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Unto all and upon all them that believe and something else. Believe and what? Plus nothing. Plus nothing. There's nothing else attached here. Nothing to them that believe. For there is no difference, that is, between Jew and Gentile. All right, now verse 24, or 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat. We're sinners. We're all condemned until we enter into God's saving grace. Now verse 24. Being justified freely, without a cause. By His grace. Through the redemption or the process of buying us back, that is in Christ Jesus, whom God, see it all starts with the Creator, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Yes, we have to have faith in the shed blood. You know why? There are two absolutes in Scripture that nobody, no denomination, no religious system can bypass, go under, or over, or anything else. What are they? The two absolutes. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Absolutes. Absolutes. I don't care what your denominational handle is. You will never make it without faith in his shed blood. You will never make it without faith itself. Because it's those two that we have to abide by. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Hebrews 6. No, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Hebrews 9, 22. You have to have those two absolutes. All right, now then going on in Romans chapter 3, verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. We don't claim any for ourselves. It's all because of what he has done. That he, God, might be just. See, God can never cut corners. Do you realize that? God is not a Santa Claus whose nose can be tweaked and manipulated. God will never cut corners. God will never compromise. God is absolute. All right? And he's just. And he is just in being the justifier of that person who repents and is baptized. Doesn't say that. He's the justifier of the person who what? Who believes. See? But oh, here's what I mean, those sticky jam filled fingers. They've added all this stuff to God's perfect plan of salvation. And it's not in here. It's to them who believe that God justifies. Let's go a little further. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Keeping in mind what we saw in John's gospel about the kernel of wheat falling into the ground and dying. All right, now, as Christ died for us, what do we also have to do to the old life? Die. We have to die. Okay? Romans 6. Here it comes. Verse 5. Verse 5. For sake of time. I'm not skipping anything for, because I don't want to look at it, but time-wise we've got to keep moving. Verse 5. For if we as believers... 
if we have been planted. Now why do you suppose the Holy Spirit chose to use that word? Well, the analogy of the wheat kernel. Unless that kernel of wheat falls into the ground and what? Dies. If you've had any biology at all, you know that that's a fact of science. That a seed that is planted dies and as a result of that death, new life comes out. All right, that's resurrection. See, and I'm always telling people, every spring when you see new life popping up all over the planet, what should it scream at us? Resurrection, new life. And we've experienced it by virtue of our salvation. We now have a new life. But what had to happen first? We had to die. Old Adam had to be put to death, see? And so if he's put to death, he had to be buried. And out of that burial comes new life. Now, let's put it this way. When Christ died, and as he hung on that Roman cross, who did God see in Christ, you and I. Now, don't limit his omnipotence. Don't ever put a limit on what God can do and know. When Christ hung on that cross, God saw every believer of all the ages from start to finish. So we died with him. Christ died, I died. If you're a believer today, you've died. But it didn't stop there. From the cross, where did he go? To the tomb. He was buried. He was really dead. All right, so as he's in the tomb, who does God see in Christ in the tomb? Every believer, you and I. That's what Paul teaches, that we have died with him, we've been buried with him. Now then, the glorious part, when he arose from the dead in resurrection power, again, who did God see in that resurrected? You and I. You and I. And so we have died with him. We've been buried with him. We've been raised to new life with him. That's our union with our almighty God. I'll tell you, it gets so exciting that it's almost impossible to contain. But all right, if we have been planted, see, if we have died and have been buried together with him. I'm back in Romans 6, verse 5. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. That's our hope. I'm thinking the Lord will come before I go the natural route, but if not, hey, we're still going to be resurrected, see? Doesn't matter whether there's just a particle of an atom. That's all God needs, but he's got to have that much. Because, you see, that's what John really means. That's another subject. I get that question all the time. What does it mean in John? It says, unless we have been born of the water and of the spirit. Well, good heavens, what is physical birth? Mothers, it's a water birth. And so Jesus says, unless you have been born into the physical world, as well as being born into the spiritual world, you can't have eternal life. Well, that follows. All right, and so in the physical realm now, we have been planted with him, we've died with him, and we've been resurrected with him. Now verse 6. Now these are things you don't find in your average Sunday school quarterly. I know you don't, but it's in the book. Next verse. Knowing this, knowing, full knowledge, that our old man is crucified with him. Now, can you make it any plainer than that? Our old man was what? The old Adamic nature we're born with. And it is enmity with God. It has to be put to death. And that went when we believed the gospel by faith. God reckoned it crucified, dead, and with new life, see? All right, so knowing this, that our old man, the old Adam, is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed or put out of commission, he's not annihilated, he's merely lost his power, that henceforth we should not serve that old Adamic nature. That's what the word sin means in Romans. We're now reckoning him dead. 
and we're alive under Christ. That's why a believer should never have any tantalizing thoughts for the things of the flesh. That's the old Adam. We shouldn't hanker to be out there with the world. That's the flesh. We just read about it. That should be the last thing on the mind of the believer because we have a whole new set of priorities. All right, verse 7, for he that is dead, the man that's, the woman's been crucified with Christ, is freed from that old Adam. So now if we're dead with Christ, we believe we will live with him. Why? Because of resurrection. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Well, those are all Pauline principles. Let me show you one more, and then we're going to look at the rapture, and then we're going to go home, if we don't get raptured first. <laughs> Because I think we're getting close. I, I really do. With the way things are going in this world, I don't see how it can go much longer. Come back with me to Galatians for a moment. Verse 17. Verse 17. Galatians 5. Didn't I give you the chapter? I'm sorry. Now you know what my poor wife goes through on that program. <laughs> She's sitting over there mouthing, Give me the chapter! <laughs> Okay, Galatians 5, verse 17. For the flesh. What did I tell you Paul means by the flesh? The old sin nature, see? For the flesh, that old Adam, lusteth, or I prefer the word warreth, from the same Greek root. For the flesh warreth against the spirit, that new nature. And the spirit wars against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would. In other words, we're in a constant battle. The old flesh says, go and enjoy it. The spirit says, you don't need that. And there's the battle. All right, now then, let's go on. If you are led of the spirit, you don't need the law. See how plain that is? You don't have to have the Ten Commandments because the Spirit takes the place of that. And so these are all Pauline truths that when we come into this dispensation of the grace of God, we're not under the law, we're under the control of the Spirit, we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace through faith plus nothing, and now we're members of the body of Christ. Now I've got to back up one more. 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and this is the only baptism that counts for eternity. Now I know some of you are in groups that demand water baptism for membership, and that's all right, well and good. But you have baptized just as many unbelievers as anybody else. I know, because I've been there. My goodness, we have, my days past, we have interviewed people and we have tried to determine that they're truly believers and we go ahead and baptize them and it isn't long and they're so far out in the world you can't even imagine it. So I know that every church has unbelievers, baptized, memorized and all the rest. But here is one where the unbeliever never gets in and that's the body of Christ. All right, verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12. For as the body, the human body, is one and has many members. In other words, we've got toes and fingers and ears and eyes. Those are all members, but we're under one brain, one mind. And all the members of that one body, being many, are one. So also is Christ, or the body of Christ. It's composed of multitudes of members. We're all individuals, but we're all members of the one body. Now here's how we get there. Verse 13. For by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we are all, not just the elite, not just those who have a particular experience, but every believer, we are all baptized by the Holy Spirit into the one body. Not with water, with the Holy Spirit. Whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, we have been all made to drink into or partake of that one 
Holy Spirit, who alone can place that new believer into the body of Christ. And it happens the moment we're saved. The moment we believe, the Spirit places us into the body. Now, once you're in the body, you have fellowship believers. I don't care where you go. Iris and I can testify. We can go from one in this country to the other. Step into the foyer of total strangers. And in 30 seconds, it's as if you've known each other all your life. I mean, it's fabulous. And they don't have to have the same denominational handle. I just don't go for that at all. But when you're members of the body of Christ, you have that affinity that is immediately discernible. And you just can't help but know it. All right, and that's the difference between the true believer baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, whether he's a Methodist, Lutheran, or whatever you may imagine to be. That isn't what counts. It's are you a member of the body of of Christ. That's for eternity. Membering in a local church is only for maybe a lifetime. Good place to get married and buried, but uh, <laughs> maybe that's as far as it goes, see? But to be a member of the body of Christ is for all eternity. All right, now then, the church on earth is going to have to end from the letters of the same apostle that introduced it. And that will have to go to 1 Corinthians again, chapter 15, starting at verse 51. Behold, I show you a what? Mystery. What did I say the word meant? Secret. Paul is revealing a secret. And you know what? You can't find it anywhere else except Paul. See, that's why I'm adamant. I'll argue with anybody. No, I don't want to argue. The church will not go into the tribulation. It cannot. Because the church is a Pauline revelation that is completely insulated from God's dealing with Israel in prophecy. It just won't fit. Here we are. We're not under law. We're under grace. But the tribulation is going to be back where? Under the law. You can't put a grace age person under the law. So you see, the church cannot, I don't care how many times they write, the church cannot go into the tribulation because the body of Christ is insulated and the reason they can't see it is they will not go back and look at the mysteries revealed to the Apostle Paul. I get letter after letter. They don't agree with my view on the rapture. And then you know all the scriptures they give me? Old Testament, the four Gospels, and then on to the end. And never, never do they bring up a verse from Romans through Philemon. And I just pitch it in the wastebasket. I think if they don't know any better than that, why should I try to make a point? Because Paul alone gives us the gospel for salvation, the age of grace. Paul alone gives us the beginning of the body of Christ, the walk of the body of Christ, and the end on earth for the body of Christ. Paul alone. All right, here it is. For I show you a mystery, a secret, that's never been revealed to any other writer of Scripture. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. Now listen, that's obvious, isn't it? We can't go to heaven in this body. It's mortal. And we aren't all going to die. He's made that evident. There's going to be a group of people who will live to see the Lord's coming. So for those of us living and are not going to be dead and resurrected, we have to be what? Changed. Metamorphosis. Now I like to use metamorphosis, metamorphosis of the caterpillar and the butterfly except for one reason. That's so slow. <laughs> <laughs> that takes a while. But you see, our metamorphosis is going to be what? Instantaneous. Now again, be logical. If we are going to be raptured up to meet the Lord in the air and we're in here, I imagine there's a couple more floors above us. Boy, we'd be squashed like bugs on the ceiling. But you know what? We're going to be immediately metamorphosed before we even leave the floor. And we're going to be in that new body. That, listen, 
When we get into the eternal state, you and I have no comprehension of the physical and the chemical makeup of what our bodies will be. Hey, we'll go through matter like it isn't even there. And I know I'm right because when the Lord came into the upper room, did he come through the door? Where did he come from? It says he came right in with the doors and windows shut. Well, now that's obvious then, isn't it? He came right through the material. And we're going to do the same thing. I mean, that's why these things are given to us. This isn't so bizarre. With God, nothing is impossible. And he can change us in the split, split second from this mortal body to the immortal that will just be in his presence. Okay? So he says, we shall not all die physically, but we shall all be changed and fit for the immortal state in a moment. Now, the Greek word in your originals is the smallest matter of time. Now, today, you know, they've got that down pretty small, haven't they? What is it, a quark? Have I got any physicists in here in the quark? One of the smallest? Do you know, Ken? Well, anyway, they've got a new word for it now that's smaller than when I went to school. And uh, it's just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second. That's how quick we're going to be changed. That's what the book says, see? All right, next verse. At the last trump, now I've got to stop another argument. Everybody says, oh, it's the seventh trumpet in Revelation. Listen, those are trumpets, plural, and they're angels' trumpets, plural. This is God's trumpet, singular. What a difference, see? What a difference. The last trump, singular. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we... Now, I didn't make the point this morning, but here when all the other writers of Scripture, like we pointed out, James and Peter and John all spoke of these things as coming when? Shortly? In their lifetime? What does Paul expect? Paul expected the rapture to take place in his lifetime until he got to the end of his life and saw he was going to be martyred. But as he writes by inspiration, he includes himself in all of these verses on the rapture. Do you ever notice that? All right, look at it. For the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, not you, we shall be changed. He's including himself. All right, now let's go over quickly to 1 Thessalonians, the companion passage. 1 Thessalonians, <clears throat> chapter 4, First Thessalonians, chapter 4, and we can start at verse 13. 1 Thessalonians, that's in the T's, just like a library alphabetic setup. The T-H and the T-I's and then Titus, see, it's real easy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. And if you'd want to compare it to 1 Corinthians 15, ignorant of what? This mystery, another secret. If only it's the same one. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who have died physically, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. In other words, we as believers don't have to wail and weep and mourn when we lose loved one. We're going to see them again. Verse 14, if, here's the condition, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. What is that? The gospel. If we are believers of the gospel, even so them who have died believing the gospel, God will bring with him. Now watch this. At death, where does the soul and spirit of the believer instantly go? To glory. The Lord's presence. Second Corinthians 5. Absent with the body, present with the Lord. Now I'm of the impression, and I may not be right, there I know there are some that disagree, but I'm of the impression that the believers are up there in the Lord's presence, viable, aware, but not in a body. I think they're only up there in soul and spirit. They're in bliss. They're in comfort. They're in the Lord's presence. 
but I cannot see them from Scripture as being bodily enshrined. They're only up there in soul and spirit waiting for what? Resurrection day. All right, so that's what Paul is teaching here, see? That they have been sleeping in Jesus. That doesn't mean soul sleep. It just means that their body has died and their soul and spirit has taken flight into the presence of the Lord. And at this great resurrection day, God will bring those souls and spirits of the departed believers with him. Now, maybe I can, maybe I can put this on the board and help a little bit. At physical death, we lay our loved ones out in the cemetery under normal circumstances. Now we know there are those that get burned. We now know cremation is coming in and all that. But at physical death, the body is in the earth. It's buried. The soul has taken flight into the presence of the Lord. Now, at the resurrection day then, Christ is going to return only to the air. That's why I got this up here. He doesn't come to the planet like at the second coming. At the second coming, whether it's there or now over here, he comes to the Mount of Olives, and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Paul speaks of him as only coming to the air, and the resurrected saint will be reunited with their soul and their spirit and their new resurrected body here in the air then we who are alive and remain are suddenly going to be changed from the mortal to the immortal, and then all of us are now reunited, our loved ones, all the way back. Now, not for the Old Testament. This is only for the body of Christ. <clears throat> Every member of the body of Christ will be reunited, body, soul, and spirit. We're now in the presence of the Lord, and we go back into glory with him. And then while the seven years will rage down here, we'll be up here in glory and we'll be going through the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat where we will be given our reward. Not salvation, but the rewards. Now maybe that'll help a little bit for those of you who may not be able to see the soul and spirit takes flight at death, goes into the presence of the Lord. At the great resurrection day, Christ will return, bringing the soul and the spirit of the body, believers only. The Old Testament are going to have to wait. But the body of Christ, believers, will be resurrected if they've died, reunited with the soul and spirit which God brings with him to the air, those of us who are alive and remain will be suddenly changed and then we all go back with the Lord into glory whereupon we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ for reward for our life as believers. All right, now let's read on in 1 Thessalonians and I think you'll get the, the concept. <clears throat> Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, we who are alive and remain till the coming of the Lord. In other words, if the Lord should come in our lifetime, that's us. We're alive and we've remained to the coming of the Lord. We will not precede or go ahead of them who have died. Why? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump singular of God. Not one of the seven trumpets of Revelation. This is the singular trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ, our loved ones who have died ahead of us, will rise first. In other words, they're going to be resurrected, reunited with their soul and spirit, and in the next instance, we are called up. And then we are alive and remain, shall be caught up, now, in the Latin Vulgate, it is raptured. It is raptured. So when they tell you the word rapture isn't in the Bible, no, it's not in the King James, it's not in the English, but it is in the Latin Vulgate. All right, so we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, our loved ones who have been resurrected. And we will meet 
the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, by comparison, and then we're going to quit. By comparison, then, come back to Acts chapter 1, where again we're dealing with Israel. Jesus and the eleven are up there on the Mount of Olives. And he has just spent the 40 days after his resurrection with these 11 men. Peter, of course, wondering when he's going to set up the kingdom, because that's still on his mind. But now as they've watched him ascend from Mount Olives, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, just like the crowds at uh, Cape Canaveral, you know, they stand there and they just watch those rockets go. All right, and while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Must have been a fantastic experience, huh? Here they're standing on the Mount of Olives, and all of a sudden, up he goes. Verse 10, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, can't you just see them? As they were watching him go, two men stood by them, angels. And these angels said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner. Now here you have to stop a minute. What kind of a body did they watch take off from Mount of Olives? Well, I just told you, the body that went right through the wall, but yet up there on the shores of Galilee, what did he do with them? He ate with them. He walked with them. He talked with them. See? All right, this same Jesus, the angel said, that you have walked with, have talked with, and yet have seen do these miracles, he's coming again. See? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner. As you've seen him go, he's coming back. All right, now let's go back and look at the Old Testament if it isn't identical. Come back to Zechariah, next to last book in your Old Testament, chapter 14. We looked at it briefly this morning. <coughs> and with this we're going to close. As far as I know now. <laughs> I think with this we're going to close. Okay, now here is exactly what the angels were telling us. Now who were, who were the angels dealing with? Israel, the twelve, the eleven. And the prophetic program is not talking about the rapture, it's talking about the what? The second coming. Two totally different events. Seven years apart, minimum. Might be a few more. But here is the Old Testament account of the same event that you've got in Acts chapter 1. Verse 4. And his feet, physical, literal, visible, his feet shall stand in that day, the day of his second coming, upon the Mount of Olives, where were they in Acts chapter 1? On the Mount of Olives. And where did the angel say? He will so come in like manner as you've seen him go. Zechariah says the same thing. He's going to come and he's going to stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. That's second coming. That's all associated with Israel. He comes to the air for the church. My, what a difference. What a difference. We hope you've enjoyed this all-day seminar with Les Feldick. If you would like to know more about the Les Feldick ministry or want to order more study material, please write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call us at 1-800-369-7856.